Well, uh, thank you uh, all for coming. Um, it's uh, my topic today is in general the uh, quantitative aspects of uh, forces in cells. And um, so I'm going to talk a bit about how you measure forces uh, and also a bit about the overall magnitudes of different kinds of forces in cells. Um, it turns out that measuring forces is usually not a direct process. We uh, actually have to do a bit of theory to understand what our measurements mean because we're almost always doing something under a microscope. And so to relate what we're seeing under the microscope uh, to the forces that are present uh, requires a, a bit of theory. So we're going to do that first. Um, and uh, after that, we'll talk to measurements, uh, uh, talk about measurements of a few different kinds of forces. So we'll uh, first talk about the polymerization forces. These are my favorites. These have to do with the forces generated by polymerization of actin filaments and the microtubules. Um, then we'll talk about uh, what the force distribution from a whole cell or a collection of cells can look like. And here, in addition to the polymerization forces, uh, we also have myosin forces. And finally, I'll talk about osmotic forces. Uh, it turns out these uh, can actually be really huge in, uh, in cells that have cell walls, uh, like uh, bacteria or yeast or plants. Uh, the, the osmotic forces are much larger than forces that are generated by polymerization or by uh, actomyosin contraction. Uh, so the one thing I want to say is, uh, before I really get into it, do ask questions. Uh, there's a lot of terminology. I'm sure to lose somebody during the talk. So please interrupt me right on the spot um, if you get lost at all. Uh, also, uh, if you don't do that, I'll certainly talk uh, too fast and cover too much material. So um, here it goes. Um, one basic fact uh, about um, cell mechanobiology is that the total force on a cell is typically very small. And you can see this in a few ways. If you um, imagine, for example, a cell that is moving at a constant rate across the substrate. So um, we have a net force that is, uh, well, from Newton's law, we have net force is mass times acceleration. And uh, you can work that out using some reasonable estimates of the parameters. Uh, the volume of a cell uh, might be like 2,000 cubic microns uh, times the density would give the mass. And then the acceleration of a cell, let's say it's uh, actually revving up, it's received a chemotactic signal and it starts to move. Well that acceleration is still actually uh, very small. So if you put these factors together and calculate the net force on the cell, it's extremely tiny. It's two times 10 to the minus 20 Newtons, which is incredibly small. So it's basically zero. So what I'm saying actually is that in a way, F equals MA, although it's the heart of mechanics, is actually not that relevant to the motion of cells, that uh, we instead need to think uh, about uh, cells simply moving at a steady rate where the acceleration forces are, are basically negligible. Um, so we can take that uh, one step farther. Um, if we think of a cell, there are static forces exerted on the cell by the substrate, for example. And there are forces exerted on various components of the cell by other components, which are also static. And those are all adding up. But in addition, there's a drag force from the cell that's moving through a medium. So again, think of a cell on a substrate. It's moving at a steady rate. Uh, it's pushing the medium aside as it moves. And there's a small force that's associated with that. But that force, again, is very small. And uh, the drag force. Um, if you don't know this formula, don't worry about it, but uh, the drag force is uh, determined by the viscosity of the medium and the size of the moving object and the velocity. And if you put reasonable estimates of these parameters into the calculation, you again get a really tiny force that's less than a single picanewton on a whole cell. 
so it really means that these various entities that are exerting force on the cell or on parts of the cell are in balance with each other. So the sum of all the forces acting on the cell is zero. And finally, it also turns out that the gravitational force acting on a cell is very small. Um, I have to get rid of something here on my screen, excuse me. Well, okay, thank you. Uh, and so the, uh, if you work out the gravitational force on a cell, again, it's like less than a picanewton for a whole cell. So we, we usually don't consider that unless you put it in a centrifuge. If you put it in a centrifuge, gravity effectively becomes much stronger, and then, of course, they go to the bottom. So here is what I mean by balance of forces. Uh, we got a couple of people pulling on a rope here, and nothing's happening. They're, they're just at a standstill, yet we know there are forces being exerted. And so if we think of an imaginary dividing line here, well, the, uh, the force on the left is actually being pulled to the right by the other part of the rope. And uh, this piece of the rope is being pulled to the left by this hand. And similarly, on this side. So if we think of each chunk of the rope, there is a balance of forces on that that is pulling it, uh, that one is pulling to the right and one is pulling to the left, and they are all canceling out. And this is typically what's happening uh, when we look at forces in a biological cell. Now we think of tension, we'll think of tension and compression in the context of biopolymers. When we're thinking of uh, cells or tissues, we typically talk uh, about stress. And stress is a force that's exerted across a whole plane. Uh, and um, there, it has, there are two different types of orientations of stress. Uh, this one here, when there is a pulling force, if you imagine taking a large block and pulling up on the top part and down on the bottom part, uh, then this is called a tensile stress. Uh, on the other hand, if you pull the two parts sideways, you have a, a rightwards force on this block and a leftwards force on that block, then the, uh, that's called a shear stress. Uh, both shear stress and tensile stress uh, are present in biological cells. And pressure, pressure is a stress. Pressure is just an isotropic compressive stress. So these are really the, the two things that we'll be talking about for the most part, rather than the net force on any particular cell. Any questions so far? Okay, so this is how it works out uh, in cells. So here on the left, uh, we have a, a cell with uh, a, an osmotic pressure on the inside that's pushing out on the cell membrane. But on the other hand, there is a cortex, uh, actomyosin, um, around the edge of the cell. And that is holding the membrane in place and keeping it from moving out. And so then there is a balance between the internal pressure of the cell that's pushing out and the contraction from the cortex that's keeping it in a static configuration. If we put that cell on a substrate, then that substrate tends to stretch out the cell. The cell will flatten on the substrate. And that means that there are outward forces that are, that's these red arrows at either edge of this flattened cell. And uh, those are pulling the cell out and correspondingly the cell is pulling in on the substrate. So a cell typically will be contracting and exerting inward forces on the substrate. And uh, pretty much the same thing happens on the right here. Uh, where we put two cells together. In that case, there's a junction between the two cells and there is an outward force exerted at the junction, but at the same time, the cells are uh, pulling inwards. Okay, uh, and um, so for thinking about the magnitudes of forces in cells, there's a couple of facts that are really useful to know. Our basic energy scale, Boltzmann's constant times the temperature, 
is 4.1 piconewtons times nanometers. It's usually given in terms of joules, but when you convert it into these friendlier units, it ends up having a friendlier magnitude also. Also, a megapascal. A megapascal is a typical magnitude of uh, osmotic pressure in a plant. That ends up being a piconewton per nanometer squared. And that's uh, 10 atmospheres or 147 pounds per square inch or uh, about uh, five times the pressure in a car tire. Okay, so now let me talk a little bit about how we relate the, what we see in the microscope to the magnitude of a measured force. And we always need some kind of reference to convert our image to a force. So, for example, it could be temperature. We'll see that a little bit later, but it could also be the known stiffness of a filament or rod. For, for example, later we'll see that we'll look at cantilevers where we know the stiffness, uh, but it's, uh, you can also use the stiffness of a biopolymer itself as a reference for uh, determining the forces. So, um, we describe the stiffness of a biopolymer in terms of a quantity called the persistence length. And the persistence length is uh, defined as the distance that you have to go along a filament before it bends roughly 90 degrees by thermal fluctuations. So here you're seeing a measurement of a persistence length. This is two actin filaments. They're uh, bundled together uh, along part of their length. And you can see that they are thermally fluctuating in solution. And uh, so, of course, a stiffer filament will tend to fluctuate less. And so, therefore, this persistence length is a measure of how stiff the filament is. Okay, and uh, so here are some uh, important biopolymers. Uh, turns out that for DNA, the persistence length is very small. It's just 75 nanometers. Uh, for actin, it's about 10 microns. And for a microtubule, it's about two millimeters. So much larger, like a thousand times larger uh, than for actin. So now I have a question for you. Uh, what if I took spaghetti? Okay, I, th I think we might consider spaghetti a biopolymer. It's, uh, it's made from biological constituents after all. So uh, what would you think the persistence length of a stick of spaghetti is? Say vermicelli, okay? The persistence length of vermicelli. So I'd like some one or two of the students to give me an estimate of the persistence length of vermicelli. <laughs> I didn't hear that one. Can you speak up? I was just saying cooked or uncooked. Oh, good point. Thank you. Yes. Uh, uncooked. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. It, it will get smaller, definitely. Uncooked vermicelli. What do you think? 100 meters? Take a guess. 50 meters. 50 meters? Okay. Good. Yeah. Got to vote for 50 meters. Any other votes? Sorry? Well, looks like everybody's agreed on 50 meters. So let's see, let's see what the answer is. There. Okay, so the actual persistence length is 100 light years of a stick of spaghetti. Okay, so these biopolymers are really very floppy things uh, if we think, think of them at our scale. But of course, at their scale, when we look at a scale of nanometers or microns, they actually look pretty rigid. So uh, this is actually, uh, the stiffness is important for our, our most fundamental way of measuring uh, polymerization forces from actin. So um, let me first tell you a little bit about polymerization forces. Okay, if you look on the left here, I've got a simulation. Uh, we have an actin filament there and it's moving next to a membrane. The membrane is this blue thing that's moving up and down. And you can see that every so often uh, this, a new subunit adds to the filament and then the movie starts over again. I didn't do many subunits. Uh, 
but uh, the idea is that uh, this growing filament acts as kind of a ratchet. This membrane moves up and down, and at some point it moves high enough that another subunit can sneak in and become the last subunit on the filament. And uh, so this is called the, uh, the Brownian ratchet model of polymerization. Um, it's, uh, it predicts that if we push down on the membrane very hard, it will sit on top of the filament and it will not allow any new subunits to come in. So it will stop the polymerization. So the prediction is um, these curves all say roughly the same thing. Uh, these are theory curves. They say that with applied force that the uh, velocity should drop. And so um, our first question that we want to ask is how, how much force can we practically get out of this process? And so here's a, a nice experiment uh, that was done um, 10 to 15 years ago in the Pollard lab. Um, and the idea is to use the stiffness of the actin filament, the known stiffness of the actin filament to, to estimate how large a polymerization force is being exerted in a particular case. So here is a filament of actin. It's about, it's a little less than a micron long. And um, at the red end, it's just glued to the substrate with a, basically with a dead myosin. At the green end, it's attached to the substrate also, but with a foramen. A foramen is a molecule that can attach to the end of an actin filament and allow it to keep growing. And uh, then they simply let the filament polymerize. Okay, so here it goes. And notice the, the, uh, the filament, let me show that to you one more time. So it grows and then buckles. Okay. So we actually uh, learned that the filament is able to exert enough force to buckle itself. And how much would that take? Well, there's a formula for that. I, of course, you don't know that, but it's a well-established result that the buckling force is required, the force required to buckle the filament is proportional to the persistence length, which we know, and other factors. And it's about a piconewton. So this experiment, just watching this filament grow and buckle, tells us that uh, it could exert a polymerization force of almost a, a piconewton. So that, that's, um, that's about the best we can do for single actin filaments. It's hard to measure forces of single actin filaments simply because they're so soft. They really, once they get to be even a micron long, they really bend very easily. So these are, these are tough experiments to do. So there's nobody that has done the measurement of how the growth of a single actin filament depends on opposing force. Just we don't see how to do that experiment. However, for microtubules, uh, the situation is different. You'll recall microtubules are much stiffer than the actin filaments. So uh, look at this geometry here. Here, this is a side view. This is we're looking at a uh, at a slide from the side here, and uh, these workers uh, made a special kind of well in the uh, slide, where a microtubule, which is glued at one end and then uh, grows from that, it can grow from that glued end, and then hit the edge of this indentation in the slide. And so that's what you're seeing in the picture. You're seeing microtubules that are glued at one end and then they grow and they hit the edge of the slide and then they bend there. Okay, and so you can use the same kind of logic there. You know, they know how stiff the microtubule is and so uh, they can work out how large these forces had to be to cause this bending at the end. And from that, uh, they could work out how fast the microtubule was growing at any particular rate of force. So they were able to make a plot of the uh, growth velocity of the microtubule as a function of the opposing force. And that's what you're seeing here. You see at the top is the force scale and you're talking about a few piconewtons of force that could be generated by this growing filament. So that's, that's what we know about the polymerization of single single biopolymers, they can exert forces on the order of a piconewton or a few piconewtons, and the growth is slowed uh, 
by uh, opposing force. Okay, now let's step it up a bit, look at a larger number of filaments. What happens if you have a bundle of filaments? And so this is a, a nice experiment that was done in Julie Terrio's lab uh, at Stanford. Um, they took a bead. The reason they have a bead is that you can exert forces on beads. Um, it turns out if you focus a laser to a very precise spot, it will actually trap a bead. So they uh, took a bead, uh, and off that bead, they grew a bundle of actin filaments. They actually took a pre-existing bundle and glued it on to the bead. And uh, after that, they let this bundle polymerize against an obstacle. And at the same time, they tracked the motion of the bead. Now, the, uh, what, what the laser does um, is to provide an equilibrium point for the bead. And if the bead moves away from that equilibrium point, uh, that means there's a force that's being exerted on it. And that force would be coming from these growing filaments. So in the experiment, by tracking the motion of the bead, they were able to measure the force on these growing filaments, or generated by the growing filaments. And this is the result. This is now, as a function of time, they are able to get the force exerted by this bundle of filaments as a function of time. And when this came out, all us theorists were really disappointed because it was so small. The, uh, the scale of the force is only a little bit more than a picanute. Okay? And we've got six to eight growing filaments here. So these, these are real weaklings. And we, we don't, this is still kind of a mystery. We don't know exactly why they are so weak. But um, on, it's not completely surprising. Uh, it, all, uh, it often happens that in, in the theory you make a very optimistic estimate of something and then what's actually measured is much smaller. So here, here we're seeing that a bundle of actin filaments is still ge generating forces on the order of picanewtons. Okay, now let's get to something still much bigger. Again, we have a bead, uh, but it's a bigger bead, and we're growing a whole actin network off this bead. Okay, so uh, this is the bead up here, and uh, a, uh, a catalyst for actin polymerization, or an actin nucleator, is placed on the surface. And that causes a a many actin filaments to grow off the surface in a particular direction. And so this is the bead, and then this gray here is the growing actin gel. And they've also have a, they have a suction tip on the back here so they can actually hold on to it and exert a negative force during the uh, growing process. And so this is the schematic, and this is what it actually looks like. Here at the bottom is the bead on the left, and then the black here is the actin tail, and then on the right is uh, the pipette that's holding the actin tail. And uh, in this case, uh, they, didn't, they didn't hold the bead with a laser, but they actually put it, an arm down, and it was an arm with a known stiffness. So the, again, they could know exactly how large a force was exerted. And this is now what happens to the growth velocity as a function of force. And you see, now you're talking about nanonewtons rather than piconewtons, and this is just because you have so many growing filaments. So uh, you're getting forces of a few nanonewtons. Uh, the velocity, again, is dropping with force. Uh, but what's interesting is that uh, the velocity increased when there was a pulling force. So the, the negative force here would be a pulling force. <clears throat> and that means that uh, at, we think that means that as you pull on these filaments, that a gap uh, is opened up. And this makes it easier for new subunits to come in and uh, cause polymerization. OK, uh, well, now let's get still bigger and look at whole cells. And we're, we're first going to look at the total force that can be generated by a cell as it moves across a substrate. So here is the cell. And here is a cantilever that has a known stiffness. And this triangle uh, on the cantilever is actually a mirror, which you can use to measure the orientation of the cantilever, which tells you how far it's moved, how far it's bent and uh, how far it's bent, uh, 
tells you the force in the cantilever. And this is a front view. You can see the mirror here. And so the, the cell will actually be crawling at this uh, cantilever. Um, so that's the idea of the experiment. And here is now a top view. So which what you're seeing here is a cell that's moving against the uh, cantilever. Pretty soon it's going to make contact. And it kind of pushes in farther and farther. Now the cantilever is really hitting the fat part of the cell. You can see the cantilever moving to the right as the forces are getting really large. And the cell is working harder and harder to push itself through. Um, in just a second, the cell's going to make, make it all the way through to the end, to the other side of the cantilever. There you, there you go. And now it pops back. OK, so the cell crawled through uh, the cantilever and displaced it. And from that, we can figure out what kind of force it exerted. So uh, <clears throat> this is a uh, plot of the force as a function of time. And it turns out we're mostly interested in this small uh, piece at the beginning. Um, what happened was that the, the cell had a, a, a protrusion that's called a lame lamellipodium. It's kind of a layer that extends ahead of the cell. And that layer first makes contact with the uh, cantilever. And then after a while, crawls, uh, sneaks around it. And at that point, the force drops. And then the force climbs again. And so that's uh, we're, we're seeing a magnified version of that here. Here, the lamellipodium makes contact with the cantilever. Uh, and then the force rapidly climbs. But after a while, the lamellipodium sneaks around the cantilever. And the force drops to zero. And then later, we get much larger forces. But these come from the contact of the nuclear mound with the uh, cantilever. OK, now let's ask uh, a little more detailed question. We, we, uh, we look now at the total force generated uh, by a cell. But um, let's look at the distribution of forces. Okay, in fact, now uh, the cell is not pushing on anything. There's no cantilever. So there's actually not going to be any net forwards or backwards force on the cell. But we're, we're going to measure the distribution of the forces that are balancing out uh, on the cell. And so um, a really nice way of doing that is to place the cell on a substrate containing fluorescent beads. Okay, so this might be PDMS, for example, would be a typical material. Uh, then you have these fluorescent beads that are submicron in size. And uh, the cell then attaches to this. And the, the basic idea of the method is that the, um, the cell, when it exerts forces on the substrate, uh, will deform it and will move the beads. And because uh, we know mechanics really well, at least there are computer programs that know mechanics really well, uh, you can work out from the displacements of these beads what the forces had to be that uh, caused the motion. So uh, that's the, uh, the basic idea of this method. And let's see how that works out. In a particular case, this is a, a cardiac myocyte. So here's the outline of the cell. These are uh, cells. They actually beat on their own uh, spontaneously. Uh, and uh, so what you see here in the yellow is the displacements of uh, the beads in the substrate. And the red arrows are the forces that are calculated from those displacements. And what you can see is that the arrows actually all point inwards. So you get these, these inwards forces that are being exerted on the substrate. And that's a very characteristic thing of uh, almost all types of cells, that uh, they, they grab the substrate and then try to contract it. And conversely, the substrate is, is stretching the cell at the same time. And so they're, they're basically locked in a tug of war. Now, what's particularly neat about the myocytes is that the, uh, the forces oscillate over time. So they added up all these contractile forces as a function of time, and they found this rhythmic behavior 
with a period of like a, a second. What's also really um, interesting about these cells, and this holds for many types of cells, is that the strength of the forces increases with the stiffness of the substrate. So this quantity here, Young's modulus, that's a measure of the stiffness of the substrate. And you can see here in this plot that the, um, the, the total force, the sum of all the, um, the, the sum of all the contractile forces really uh, jumps when you get to uh, stiff substrates. So the cell is able to sense the stiffness of the substrate and when it does that, when it knows that it's on a, a stiff substrate, it ramps up its own contractile forces. Okay. Um, now here is a, uh, a whole layer of cells. You can do the same thing here. Uh, so each, uh, these are migrating kidney cells and they are placed on a substrate uh, containing beads and here you can see the process of determining the bead displacements a little more clearly uh, in that you measure the positions of the beads with and without applied forces. Uh, so uh, the green is with the forces and the red is without so the, the difference for any bead, the difference between the green position and the red position is a measure of how much it got displaced. Okay, and this is the results. Uh, this is the uh, direction of, the, uh, this is the actual force in the x direction, the sideways direction. And you see that there's actually a pretty large variation. There's no real uniformity there. It's as if the cells are acting pretty independently. Um, but when you uh, look at the stress, you can actually see that there are foci. So here is the stress in this layer of cells. Now, positive stress corresponds to tension, where cells are actually pulling on each other. And negative stress corresponds to compression. So uh, what you're seeing in this case is that we're, uh, we're seeing real foci of uh, tension in certain regions in this collection of cells. And it's not really known where that comes from, but it's, uh, it's a phenomenon that we'd like to understand. Okay. Now, another way of doing this that's a little more direct is to use micropillars. You, instead of uh, looking at the displacement of beads in a substrate, you have an array of pillars and you look at how much each pillar is bent. And that's easier because the pillars are relatively independent of each other. So the force at any point is the extent is proportional to the extent of bending of that pillar. And uh, here's a um, pic picture out of Chris Chen's lab from a while back of a uh, smooth muscle cell uh, being put on an array of pillars. And out here at the edges, you can see that the, uh, the pillars are pointing straight up, nothing is happening, but uh, closer to the center where the cell is interacting with the pillars, you see uh, that the pillars are being bent inwards. And again, you know the stiffness of the pillars, so it's straightforward to calculate um, the forces in this case. And um, what you find is that as the cell spreads, that the average force, this contractile force, increases quite a bit. So the cell sits down on the substrate, then spreads out. And as it spreads out, it exerts larger and larger forces. And again, um, just like in, in the case of the myocyte, the forces are contractile. The cell is pulling in at the same time as the pillars are pushing out on the cell. Okay, and finally, uh, here I want to talk about a technology that's really taking off at this point. There, there is uh, a lot of uh, flux happening in this area, and that's using molecular force sensors. Uh, the idea here is that you can actually measure the stretching of a given molecule, and uh, you know how that stretching corresponds to a fluorescent signal that comes out of the molecule. 
and it's called FRET. Uh, it means a first or residence energy transfer. But uh, from our point of view, uh, the idea is simply that there are uh, two fluorophores. There is a so-called donor and an acceptor. So uh, the donor is green here, and the acceptor is green is red. Now, if you just think about the donor by itself, it can uh, emit fluorescence. Uh, it's designed that way. Uh, but this combination of the two uh, has the effect that sometimes the fluorescence from this donor, instead of coming out as light that we can see, uh, goes into the acceptor and we don't see it. So basically, when the acceptor and the donor get close to each other, we no longer see this particular signal. And so on that basis, by looking at the emission, by looking at the fluorescence from this complex, we're able to see whether the donor and acceptor are close to each other or not. And so here, when they're close to each other, we would see less signal when they're far apart uh, at, um, at a higher force then we would start seeing the signal from the acceptor, from, from the donor, excuse me. And so uh, these can be calibrated. So in any particular case, you can figure out how much force is being exerted between the cell and the substrate. So that's the geometry here, that there's a cell here, a substrate below here, and there are forces between the cell and the substrate. So this is an illustration of what you can learn by this. Here, the, uh, the red is the force that's measured using these molecular force sensors. And the green is the concentration of an important protein called paxillin. And here you can see that there's a very strong overlap of the paxillin with the force generation. And this leads us to believe that the paxillin is important either for the force generation or, main, uh, or the force maintenance uh, machinery. Now, um, another method we can use to measure stress directly is uh, laser ablation. So uh, this is a cell. We're again looking at it from the top. And we're, these long fibers are called stress fibers. And uh, they are fibers that are built out of actin and myosin and are generally in a, straight, uh, in a, a state of contractile stress. Okay? They, they could connect different adhesion points, for example. Uh, and what's going to happen is that a, a laser is going to get focused on the stress fiber, and it's a powerful laser, so it's actually going to break it. And this is what happened here uh, on the right side. Uh, the, uh, the laser blast, uh, it made a hole in the stress fiber, and the, the ends start pulling apart. So that is a very direct way of seeing that the stress fiber was under tension. It was like uh, if I were to take a rope and cut it in the middle, then the two ends would uh, move apart. And farther along in this process, we see that the ends of the stress fiber continue to move. Init the initial motion actually is, is determined by the viscosity of the medium through which the stress fibers are moving. Uh, but later on, the final position is determined by the elastic equilibrium of the medium. Excuse me, Anders? Yes. Could you just explain that a little bit more, why the initial displacement is determined by viscosity and the later displacement by viscosity? Ah, right. It's because uh, it's, um, it's moving very f initially here. The, uh, it's, it's been cut. And there is uh, initially a, a very rapid motion. Now, uh, in general, in, in a system like this, uh, where there's a viscous interaction with a fluid, and there's also an equilibrium state, um, if the motion is very rapid, then the viscous force is going to be the largest. Uh, and so in this case, the initial motion is very rapid. And in that case, uh, the viscous force is larger. Um, and But of course, that depends on the parameters of the system. So it's not anything I can prove to you. I'm, I'm trusting the authors. They, they calculated this on the basis of the viscosity of the medium and saw that uh, that initially that initial rate of motion that velocity was uh, determined by the viscosity and also the tension so it, it, that initial rate of motion would essentially be the tension divided by the viscosity 
and then later on when it settles down when it's still there really is no viscous contribution and so at that point it has to be the elastic properties of the medium does that make sense yes okay thanks okay and finally i'm going to talk about uh, osmotic pressure uh, so here's a, a diagram of uh, osmotic pressure in a walled cell here we call it turgor pressure uh, but it's just the difference between the osmotic pressure on the inside and the osmotic pressure on the outside. And so uh, in the diagram here, you see that the turgor pressure is pushing out. Uh, there's an interior concentration uh, and an outside concentration. And the formula here says that the uh, turgor pressure, which we'll call pi, is related in a very simple fashion to the difference between the concentrations on the inside and the outside. Uh, and so how would you measure this? Well, one way that you could measure it is to increase C out until it becomes equal to C in. Because what will happen then is that there no longer is any turgor pressure. There's nothing pushing the membrane out against the cell wall. And then the membrane will start to move away from the cell wall. So the, you increase, you have a delta C out, that's how much you add, equal to C in minus C out, and then you crank up that delta C out until the turgor pressure vanishes and you can see the membrane moving away from the cell wall. So here's an experiment illustrating that. Uh, what has been done now is that on this axis, the C out, the external concentration is increasing and then you see at first that because there are uh, osmolites on the outside, they're pushing in, there is less pressure holding the cell wall out, so the cell gradually shrinks. But then at this point, you see something very sudden happen, and that is when the membrane is leaving the cell wall, and then this concentration is what you think is the, uh, what determines the turgor pressure. So uh, that's the schematic. Here's what it actually looked like. So here, this for yeast, sodium chloride is what they're using on the outside. And what they see is that at some point, then all of a sudden, the volume inside the membrane drops precipitously. And they were able to convert that to a pressure and saw that that happened roughly when the, the pressure is half a megapascal. So they this measurement, got a trigger pressure of half a megapascal, um, that's probably too large. And the reason is uh, that uh, the cell fights back. As you increase the uh, trigger pressure, or as you increase the concentration on the outside, the cell fights back by increasing the concentration on the inside. So eventually, you need to change the outside concentration by much more than you should have. And so for that reason, this, this is probably an overestimate. And I want to mention a more uh, recent experiment, uh, which I feel is more direct. Uh, and it's done by nano indentation. So here is your cell. And what you do is to put a, um, you put a nano indenter into that cell very rapidly. Okay? And this is a diagram. This is actually a picture from a rubber ball. The people that did this experiment did both the cells and a big rubber ball just to verify the method. Uh, but what the, the physics analysis showed that the, uh, the osmotic pressure is proportional to the spring constant that you measure when you indent the cell. And so this is the measurement of that spring constant as a function of indentation. Uh, it turns out when the indentation is small, there are other things that contribute. But when the indentation is large enough, you get a very well-defined spring constant. And from that, the physics analysis uh, allowed them to deduce that the turgor pressure is actually uh, 0.2 megapascals, about three times smaller than the other measured ones. But these values have actually been all over the place uh, in the literature for plants and, uh, and bacteria and yeast. So they're pretty uncertain. But to me, this is the best measurement that's been done yet. Uh, so uh, that's what I wanted to say today. Um, I guess in one way, I've shown you that there are various kinds of measurements that we can do, but in fact, it's really only a very uh, limited range of forces that we're able to measure. And we're still not able to measure some of the forces 
that we'd really like to get a handle on. Uh, we're getting new technologies that are coming in, especially the molecular force sensors. These are pushing the field forward. Uh, but even the basic uh, problem of measuring the distribution of stress inside a cell is very hard, and we really don't know how to do that. So I'll thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to take any more questions. So thank you. Any questions? One question I have is on the uh, cantilever and the cell moving against the barrier. Uh, yes. What material is used for that cantilever, and um, what are the like pros and cons or things that you have to think about in terms of selecting the material? Okay, let's find that cell. There we go. Right. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, I, well, to tell you the truth, um, these are not experiments that I've been close to, and uh, I really don't know the answer, but I, I think for this kind of experiment, I don't think it's actually that critical, just because everything is rather large. You know, the, the scale bar here is, is five microns, so the, the spatial scale isn't that large. Uh, I think, actually, uh, I would say the challenge would be making the cantilever material thin enough that would act, that it'll actually displace under a force of like three nanonewtons. So I think that's the challenge, but uh, I haven't done these experiments, so I'm afraid I can't really say more than that. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Um, if you have any. Please feel free to get in touch with Anders. And Anders, thanks very much. OK, um, thank, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Anders. I'm going to uh, take you off the presenter role now. OK, yeah, got it. Mm -hmm. Thanks Thanks again. <laughs> okay. All and right, next, thanks Thanks a lot. See you. Talk is at, uh, at uh, 1030, so you have a bit of a break. Yeah, I'm just I don't know why he's suddenly appeared at the end. So it's something with this connection. Yeah. Oh, he came. That was the next time.